out of the fiery furnace is brought to you by a company that makes aluminum for transportation, construction, and manufacturers of consumer products all around your house. Commonwealth Aluminum. This was the battlefield of a revolution. It was a revolution fashioned by a relative handful of men of inventive, resourceful intelligence. The outcome of their victory left no single life untouched, either then or since, anywhere. And more than 200 years later, we are still trying to digest and deal with the consequences. They changed the physical face of that idealized portrait of Britain we have as Merry England, and they made the green and pleasant land into the world's workshop. With devoted attention, historians have considered why it was that the Industrial Revolution happened first here in Britain. They rule out fate because men make revolutions. But what is clear is that from about the middle of the 18th century, the British began a spectacular advance, a self-sustaining wave of vigor that within a hundred years won them an empire and made them the dominant world power. The men who made that revolution in England and exported it, shared common convictions about personal liberty, they felt deeply called to self-fulfillment, and they were driven by another powerful impulse, necessity. At some point during all the long ages in which man has played with fire, some genius, some inspiration made the leap to a new truth. The discovery that partly burned wood made a more versatile fuel than wood itself. The slow controlled combustion of the charcoal making process drives off water and other elements and leaves when it's over an almost pure carbon which burns with a clean smokeless heat. Among the consequences of that revelation was the beginning of one of man's more devastating assaults upon liberal, bountiful nature. Over tens of thousands of years, trees were cut and split and turned into charcoal for cooking and for heating, just as one of the last of the charcoal burners is doing here in Austria. When the decline of the Dark Ages was reversed, despair gave way to hope, and optimism was sustained by the prospect and the realization of success. But the forests, as Europe began its spectacular rise to dominance, were being subjected to an accelerating and even more sustained attack. And by the end of the 16th century, Europe was facing a situation which has returned to us in our own time to find a place in our contemporary vocabulary its first great energy crisis, a critical shortage of wood. And charcoal was being consumed in relentlessly increasing quantities with the production of what by this time had become the most widely desirable material available to man, iron. The open valleys of the Weald in Kent still warm to the autumn sunshine as they've done for centuries. But this is not the countenance of England as it used to be. Once the wheel was all like this surviving wood. But the trees stood on chalk, and in that chalk the Romans found iron. To smelt the iron, they needed charcoal. It was the beginning of a decimation. The forests of Britain were admired for a celebrity among trees, famous for the great age it attained, and out of which over centuries had been carved the wooden walls of old England. 
Here in Portsmouth lies that revered survivor of a long age of wooden warships reaching back to the time of Alfred the Great, Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar, HMS Victory, 2,100 tons of oak. Literally thousands of trees were cut to make a single ship of the line like this. In Victory's case, 300,000 cubic feet of oak went into her, a whole forest. Much earlier than the launching of HMS Victory in 1765 and Nelson's day, incidentally, that's where the little admiral was standing when he was shot by a sniper from the foretop of the French ship, Redoutable. Much earlier than Nelson's time, two centuries before, the steps had been taken to establish the sea service as a distinct profession. And that was done by Henry VIII, who in effect founded the Royal Navy and built here at Portsmouth the first Royal Naval Dockyard in which victory lies today. Hearts of Oak were the Navy's ships and Oak built the ships of the maritime trade. At the same time, the population of Britain was making increasing use of iron and the skill of British iron makers had built up a flourishing export trade in, among other things, iron cannon. Two uses of timber from the English forests were therefore in competition. So critical did the shortage of good oak for great ships like this become that a series of laws were passed in England in 1558 forbidding, as it was put, the felling of trees to make coals for the burning of iron. Uh, that effectively snuffed out the iron-making industries of Sussex and the Weald of Kent, and the iron makers were forced to look for something else. What they turned to, and how they learned to use it, had the most profound consequences. No one knows when this black rock was first deliberately burned. It was so long ago that the memory of it has been lost to us. But there are misty images of women dressed in long dresses and wearing shawls with baskets on their heads, harvesting it from beaches which have been handed down in paintings and pictures into modern times. And certainly one of the first places where it is known that coal was gathered and used was here in Scotland, along the shores of the Firth of Forth during the Roman occupation of Britain. The civilizations and cultures of the ancient world all occupied areas in which coal, in rich seams, did not outcrop on top of the ground. In the days of the Roman Empire, the most abundant coal seams which did outcrop on the surface were here in this part of Britain. And it was from these exposures at the water's edge that it got its name sea coal. After the Romans left, all mention of coal went with them. But with the revival after the Dark Ages, interest in coal reappears. And it was here, in the 12th century, that the first recorded digging of coal took place in Britain, under the rocky outcrops in the cliffs behind the beach at Caridon on the Firth of Forth. Coal mining underground began on a small scale and as little more than poor and lowly family enterprise. From the Middle Ages onwards, the use of coal increased rapidly, especially after houses were designed to include chimneys, which made the smoke and the fumes more tolerable. 
industries such as brickmaking, brewing and glass and china turned to coal as charcoal became scarce and more expensive. Britain was destined to become the world's largest coal producer. Her people were almost kippered in the smoke. But a vital industry was held back. Attempts to smelt iron with coal failed. The softness of coal choked up the furnaces and its impurities made the iron brittle and useless. There is no surviving portrait of the man who came to this quiet valley in Shropshire and in 1709 solved the energy problem in the iron industry. Abraham Darby had learned about metal casting in Birmingham, making hand mills of iron to grind malt for the breweries. Darby had brought those elementary skills to the small town he was to make world famous, Colebrookdale on the banks of the Severn. He had set up in business here to make cooking pots, not in the customary brass, but in cast iron, which was cheaper. The Industrial Revolution had many roots and origins, but this place in Colebrookdale has a special claim to the nativity, and Abraham Darby was present at the creation. When Darby came here to this Shropshire Valley of his, the price of charcoal had risen so high that he had a strong inducement to find an alternative, and two things with which he had been familiar in his apprenticeship years in the malting industry assumed a great importance for him. The first was his general knowledge about the casting of iron, and the other was a particular interest in the fuel used by the brewers of Birmingham in the making of malt. That fuel was coke, which is made from coal in much the same way as charcoal is made from wood. Partial controlled burning gets rid of the impurities and leaves behind a hard, clear burning fuel, coke. Darby seems also to have been aware that the coal in Shropshire was particularly suitable for making coke. Such were the secret arts and mysteries of his interest in iron and coke together that it's recorded he stopped up the keyhole of the room in which he and his associates discussed it. This is Abraham Darby's furnace, built on the site of an older one erected in 1638 and where the generations of this famous family succeeded him together with the benchmarks of their various achievements. It was here that Darby first succeeded in replacing charcoal by coke for the smelting of iron. And in 1709, the first iron of quality made with anything other than charcoal flowed out through this opening. Iron could now be made using the apparently limitless resources of Britain's coal fields, rather than the severely restricted supplies of charcoal. It was the gateway to a new Iron Age, and a new dynasty was enthroned here, the Iron Masters. Colebrookdale, almost overnight, became the centre of Britain's iron industry. One of its first ironworks is still casting iron stoves in sand moulds, just as it did in the 18th century. The discovery that iron could be smelted with coke broke the energy impasse of centuries and it immediately multiplied the demand for coal. At this time the coal mining industry itself faced a problem that had got progressively worse as the surface seams were dug out and the mines were compelled to go deeper and deeper. Water is the miner's ancient and most formidable enemy.
With the resurgence of mining in Europe after the Dark Ages, all kinds of pumping devices were tried. All of them were inadequate. There was one crippling, insurmountable difficulty. It's hard for us to grasp now, but as recently as the year 1700, there was nowhere in the world any source of power for the continuous driving of machinery other than wind, water, or living muscle. But the demand for coal was so great that a solution had to be found to the problem of getting water out of the coal mines. And it was found here in Cornwall where flooding in the tin and copper mines was particularly severe. It was found by that archetype of the Industrial Revolution, the practical man. He was an ironmonger named Thomas Newcomen. Newcomen lived in Dartmouth in Devon and had a business supplying iron tools to the miners in Cornwall. He was, of course, aware of the flooding problem in the mines and about 1700 began experimenting with a kind of pump driven by the newly appreciated but little understood force of atmospheric pressure. Today a corner of the municipal gardens in Dartmouth houses one of the earliest surviving examples of a simple yet massive individual achievement. Newcomen's engine, the very first practical source of mechanical energy, consists of a large iron cylinder with a piston inside it. This is connected to his famous beam, pivoted in the middle. The other end of the beam is connected to a pump down the mine. The pump and its rod are heavier than the piston, and so pull down their end of the beam. This brings the piston to the top of its cylinder, drawing in steam from a boiler. At that moment, a jet of cold water is injected into the cylinder. The steam suddenly condenses, leaving a partial vacuum beneath the piston. The pressure of the atmosphere on top of the piston, in this case two tons, instantly forces the piston down. That movement lifts the other end of the beam. And when it does, comes water. <laughs> Thomas Newcomen's invention was one of the great turning points in history. And these, therefore, are the very early remains, the skeleton of a revolution. They give us some small impression of his enormous achievement in, as it was said at the time, raising water by fire. The first steps towards a solution of that problem had been taken by the scientists in the 17th century. They had had no difficulty with the theoretical aspects of atmospheric pressure but they had invariably been defeated when they tried to practically apply them. And that was the measure of Newcomen's personal triumph. He was an ironmonger trained as a blacksmith, not a scientist, not an engineer, but a practical, solitary man of genius with the insight of genius. T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, said of genius that when it happened, it was like the flash of the kingfisher across the darkened pool, vivid and unmistakable. And so was it with Newcomen's solution to an age-old, hitherto insuperable barrier to further advance. He gave to man the first fully automatic invention since the clock. And with it, he ushered all mankind into the modern era. 
for this was to be the force which powered the Industrial Revolution. And as for Newcomen himself, no portrait of him survives. We have no idea what he looked like. Newcomen's first practical engine began pumping water out of a coal mine in 1712. Within a decade, scores of similar beam engines were at work in Cornwall and Devon and all over Europe. For 50 years, Newcomen's atmospheric engine admitted no superior. In 1763, the instrument maker at Glasgow University was asked to repair the scale model of one. That instrument maker's name was James Watt. He was content with no mere repair, but made fundamental improvements to Newcomen's design. One was to make steam do the work on the piston instead of the atmosphere, as Newcomen had done. The steam engine had been born. On a quiet stretch of the Kennet and Avon Canal in Somerset, the oldest steam engine anywhere in the world, still performing the task it was installed to do, is this one. It's been pumping water here since Napoleon marched to Moscow in 1812. The principle of Newcomen's beam survived into the 20th century. The Cornish engine reached its final imperial dimensions in these massive pumps at Kew. For more than a century, until 1944, they supplied water from the Thames to London. This great engine, with a piston force of more than 100 tons, pumped 30,000 tons of water a day. For such huge pieces of machinery, they're remarkably quiet. Gentle giants with heavy breathing. Dinosaurs of the Industrial Revolution. By the end of the 18th century, the natural forces of wind, water, and living muscle had been superseded by steam, tireless and obedient. Wood and leather were replaced by brass and iron. The conversion of the back and forth action of the piston into rotary motion multiplied the application of steam engines throughout industry. Among the first to succumb to these new seductions were the ancient crafts of spinning and weaving.
The steam engine made the textile counties of Lancashire and Yorkshire the hub of a manufacturing empire with worldwide dominions. It was this mechanization of the textile industry that many historians use as a benchmark for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. The coal mining industry too was radically transformed below and above ground. Steam winding engines lowered the men and brought up the coal and raised productivity. Huge supplies of coal for iron making became accessible and virtually unlimited. Furnaces and foundries spawned. Colebrookdale itself shook with noise and glowed with fire day and night. The furnaces they called Bedlam are still standing, the now extinct volcanoes of that remarkable time of change and upheaval in the second part of the 18th century, about the time the American colonists were getting ready to fight for their independence from England and Captain Cook was bound for Botany Bay. All this then was a scene of amazing business. The furnaces blasting away at night, the stupendous roar of their bellows was compared to the roar of guns, were an assault on the mind, the eyes, and the ears. One contemporary said of Colebrookdale then that it needed only Cerberus to make it look like a heathen hell. So there's not much doubt that they deserve their name, as the bedlam of the industrial era invaded the rural quiet of England and left amid all the excitements an enduring melancholy mark. As the Industrial Revolution gained momentum, the iron masters of Colebrookdale were full of exuberance and adventure. There seemed no limit to what their industry and their iron could do. It was about noon on the 25th of March, 1781, after he had preached a sermon in Shrewsbury the previous evening, that John Wesley took this walk in the Severn Valley in Shropshire. He had set out to see the first brilliant audacity of the new ironmasters. We walked, he confided to his diary, to take a view of the new bridge thrown across the Severn. It is a single arch, 100 feet broad, 52 feet high, 18 feet wide, and it's all of cast iron, weighing many hundreds of tons. And with nothing else in the English landscape at that time to measure it by, Wesley saw it in the classical perspectives of the ancient world and compared it to the Colossus at Rhodes. The use of iron for big structures was quite new and largely untried. And the ironmasters kept one foot on the shore of an earlier era for reassurance. The joints in the ironwork are those of the carpenter, dovetails and mortises. This was the world's first iron bridge. Its arch of iron still is sound and is graceful 200 years later. It is the first undoubted masterpiece of the Industrial Revolution. 
And it was the very first, the progenitor of all the many forms of metal bridges which followed after it. It is the first great work of civil engineering in iron. As the pulse of the revolution quickened throughout England, the old arteries of transport proved inadequate. Although a canal network had been called into being by the explosive growth of industry, it reflected the less urgent rhythms of rural English life. Barges could carry heavier loads than carts on the muddy, rutted roads, but they were no faster. The canals either had to pick up the beat of the industrial engine or fall to one side. The canal managers produced an innovation to speed up the loading and unloading of their barges, but in the end, it brought about their eclipse. The paths which led from the factories and warehouses of the Derbys of Colebrookdale took many different directions, but they gave firm, clear leads to the future. The idea of using what used to be wooden tracks leading from this rather ecclesiastical-looking warehouse down to the water's edge, along which they used to wheel carts to the barges, is not new. But as the new iron flowed from the new furnaces, the iron masters were the first to plate these channels cut in the brick with iron, plateways as they called them. These grooves and channels in the paths at Colebrookdale, now partially restored, when they were plated with iron, became the first clear pointer to that single aspect of the Industrial Revolution, which above all others, came to hold the affection and have the greatest impact on the mass of people. The first iron wheels and the first iron rails in the world were produced at Colebrookdale. And when they became linked so quickly in a single unified concept to the very early engines, conceived originally to pump water or to haul coal up out of the mines, then the revolution had produced its first popular marvel, the active, moving spirit of the time, the railways. The railways ended the canal era and put an end to the horse-drawn past. A great divide had been crossed. Thackeray wrote of it, we who lived before the railways and survived out of the ancient world are like Noah and his family out of the ark. With the coming of locomotive engines, some of the unremitting drudgery of physical hard work was lifted from the backs of the laboring poor. For the first time for the mass, the daily circle of contact and acquaintance was spectacularly widened. Every revolutionary liberation has a habit of imposing its own tyrannies, and so did this one. But the spirit of exhilaration which accompanied the railways was present from the very beginning. When, in 1825, on the opening day of the world's first steam-hauled public railway from Stockton to Darlington, George Stevenson drove his engine, Locomotion 1, and this is an exact replica of it, his train pulled not only coal and other merchandise, but the first of a new breed to come out of this arc, 
cheering railway passengers. The railways provided a means of distributing, quickly and cheaply, all the new things being made. They gave access to a wider world for the mass and to people whose horizons had traditionally extended little further than the confines of their own villages. The railway mania which gripped Britain during the Industrial Revolution has left a lasting nostalgia. Once machines were made mobile, the way was open for the mechanization of the most unrelenting task of mankind, growing food. Mechanization grew more of it. There was a population explosion and a general movement from the countryside to the towns. They were changes which produced some of the most disturbing images of the Industrial Revolution. Gustave Doré's scenes of London life were the dark face of the Industrial Revolution. But there was a general and sustained improvement in living standards. The very nature of poverty was changed. From this grime and soot of industrial England, one bold figure after another stepped forward. One such was both engineer and artist. The greatest expression of his daring concept now rests in the old docks in Bristol, in the same yard where he created her. When Isambard Kingdom Brunel, with that name of his like a bugle call, summoned all the enthusiasms and the new technologies of his time to build and launch the Great Britain from her dock here in Bristol in July 1843, he took a bold, romantic, imaginative stride into much that was unknown and untried as far as the building of ships was concerned. His concept was a huge assembly of things which had yet to be proved. They worked superbly, and the Great Britain became the forerunner of all the great ships of the modern era. Brunel had thrown the shipwright's textbooks overboard. He made the Great Britain twice as big as any existing ship, a hundred meters long, 3,000 tons displacement. She was the first ocean-going ship to be made of iron. The plates for her were rolled at Colebrook Dale. To make the great hull rigid, Brunel conceived a new idea altogether, watertight bulkheads. And at the last moment, he abandoned the traditional paddle wheel and gave her a propeller. He had seen just one small ship driven by that then new principle and grasped its potential fearlessly. On the New York run, which she began in 1845, the Great Britain's speed and seaworthiness were convincingly shown. Below decks, she set new standards of comfort and accommodation. The era of the ocean liner had begun.
Great Britain's triumph was abruptly cut short. She ran aground in Ireland on her fifth voyage to New York. Her owners were ruined by the accident and had to sell her. The Great Britain was put on the Australian run and using her sails in favorable trade winds to assist the engine, made 32 voyages to Melbourne in 23 years. She was used as a troop ship during the Crimean War. And later, while carrying coal around Cape Horn, her cargo caught fire. She was towed to Port Stanley in the Falklands and used as a store there until 1937, when she was abandoned. In 1970, the old ship was rescued and towed home to Bristol. Long after he was dead, and therefore it's purged of all the flatteries of contemporary judgments, it was said of Brunel that in all that constitutes an engineer in the highest sense, he had no contemporary and no predecessor. And neither, we might say, did this his great ship. She projects the vaulting imagination and spirit of confidence which was in tune with her maker and his times. As the iron bridge would become the bridge that spanned the world, so would the iron ship reduce and span the oceans. And together they would liberate millions from an ancient parochial bondage. The Great Britain serves today as a national monument to that new thinking and its execution on an epic, masterful scale in Britain. Iron ship, iron bridge were the connecting links which would cut the world down to a new size. Architects and engineers were also pushing against the limitations of iron. Cast iron, as used in the palm house at Kew, was cheap to make, but essentially brittle because of its high carbon content. Wrought iron, with no carbon, was stronger but expensive because of the extra work involved in making it. What everyone was looking for was an effective compromise. Cheap iron was just a little carbon, what is now called mild steel. But the only kind of steel then available was unsuitable. From about 1000 BC onwards, Bars of iron could only be steeled by hard labor with hammer and anvil, or by roasting with charcoal in a furnace. The secret of melting steel, though practiced in India before the Christian era, was unknown to the West until 1740, when a Yorkshire clockmaker named Benjamin Huntsman devised the process which was to make Sheffield steel world famous. Pieces of iron and charcoal were melted together in a clay crucible for several hours. This distributed the carbon evenly through the molten iron, something which hammering had not been able to do. The result was steel of superlative hardness and consistency. Such a bar of steel could be made into high-quality tools and instruments. But small ingots of this size, the limit of what was possible by Huntsman's crucible process, could not build bridges or railways. The art of crucible steel making survives at the Abbeydale Industrial Hamlet, now a historical museum in the suburbs of Sheffield. When it was built in 1833, 
The agricultural tools turned out here. Scythes and sickles brought in harvests all over the world. In its time, Sheffield steel was matchless. But crucible steel of quality was too scarce and too valuable to feed the growing appetites of the Industrial Revolution. That hunger was appeased in 1856 by another famous name, Henry Bessemer. Bessemer discovered that by blowing air through molten iron in a large converter, he could burn out the excess carbon in a spectacular reaction. The result was low carbon steel, just as good or better than wrought iron for almost every purpose, and it was cheap. The advances in steel making triggered by Bessemer's initial discovery unlocked the full energies of the Industrial Revolution throughout the world. By the end of the 19th century, steel girdled the world with railways and bridges, galvanized it with machines, and changed the profile of cities. When the Eiffel Tower was completed in 1889 to mark the centenary of the French Revolution, it used more than 10,000 tons of iron and steel. It was far more than the tallest structure on the face of the earth, the most daring use of iron ever attempted. It was a gesture of renewed buoyancy and confidence in the onward march of material progress. across the Atlantic in Thomas Jefferson's Great Republic, that the mood and the technology would be caught to run away with the world. I'm Robert Raymond, and I'm the producer of this series. At the end of the episode you've just seen, we pointed out that although the Industrial Revolution began in England, it was America which seized the mood and the technology to run away with the world. Now, from that arises an intriguing question. How did the Americans do it? How were they able to take that technology and so expand its potential as to create, in effect, the standard of living that we now enjoy? Part of the answer is to be found at historic sites like this, the Slater Mill at Portucket in Rhode Island. This was the site of the very first cotton mill in America. It was erected here in 1793 by an Englishman named Samuel Slater. This building was constructed not long after, in 1810. It's been restored and stands today exactly as it did nearly 200 years ago even down to the water wheel, which provided the motive power for the cotton spinning machinery.
the archaeologist who excavated the foundations of the building and found the fragments of the original water wheel is Dr. Al Bartovic, who now teaches at North Adam State College in Massachusetts. Dr. Bartovic has some ideas about how mills like this helped to get the American Industrial Revolution going. Well, I think the economic differences between the New World and the Old World probably lie at the heart of the differences later on in the American system of manufacturing. It turns out that at the point where uh, the Americans dissociated themselves from Great Britain politically, uh, they also closed a portion of uh, the market which uh, Great Britain enjoyed off and secured it to themselves, thereby dividing the economy into two sectors. And of course, differences can emerge then in the two uh, somewhat insulated uh, sectors of the Anglo-American economy. Uh, in America, agriculture was expanding very, very rapidly and probably lies at the heart of all of the differences that are usually cited for uh, differences in the development and application of technology. On the demand side of the economy, uh, there was an enormous growth in the aggregate demand for light manufactured products, which was not as rapid a growth in Great Britain. Among other things, the frontier was generating household after household. It had to supply itself uh, with new light uh, manufactured goods. Another element of this expansive agriculture would be the numbers of families that participated in a very similar way of life, uh, values, and so forth, uh, so that the products that were produced by manufacturers could be narrower in their range. Uh, the, the demand was for a, uh, a, a narrower range of manufactured uh, items. Um, on the supply side, of course, is the abundance of nearly everything. Native Americans in this country uh, in this land did not exploit with higher technology the resources that, that lay here from time immemorial. But when the Anglo-Americans got here with a much higher level of technology, uh, there was, or it appeared to be, a virgin land. Everything was in very great supply. People hadn't logged off all of the timber to use as charcoal and construction materials yet. Uh, as a consequence, the fabricators of uh, various pieces of, of uh, household technology uh, could afford to waste more raw materials in proportion to labor saving and capital saving uh, conditions to their adoption of technology. In fact, they could mechanize more little portions of the fabrication process at the expense, of course, of raw materials, which were wasted, especially in the earliest stages of technological development. The result of this was a greater and broader experience with the minutia of technology. Uh, more machines, more people to fix machines, more people to get familiar with machines, and a greater faith in machinery as ultimately, even if it wasn't so good right now, perfectible. Uh, in Great Britain, on the other hand, the notion hung on for a very long time that mechanically manufactured or fabricated items were inferior to the human product, and a great uh, proportion of the fabrication uh, was, for that reason, uh, among others, uh, continued to be hand work. A machine increased the output of a higher skilled worker. It didn't reduce the uh, process to a bunch of little parts that needed very little skill to execute any single piece. Um, the whole system that, that was selected for, if you wish to take a an evolutionary ecological approach was slightly different in the number of functions uh, and the number of machines that were present uh, about the time of the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition, one of the great world trade fairs, when it was finally noticed by people that the Americans did things a little differently than others. Here at the Slater Mill historic site, you can see various kinds of machines at work. They date from that early period of American industrialization. These were the tools which helped to make America the world's greatest industrial power. But even more important were the men and women who worked the machines, for Americans took to machines like no other people had ever done.
Dr. Patrick Malone teaches the history of technology at Brown University in Rhode Island. And he's also the director of the Slater Mill Historic Site. In America, unlike Britain, there was no stigma attached to working with machinery. Uh, the best and the brightest of American society often went into manufacturing and engineering. Uh, getting your hands dirty was, was not something to be ashamed of. Americans liked playing with the machines. And from actually working with machinery, uh, they developed innovative skills that, uh, that placed them in a strong position in the world economy. It also seems to me that Americans really enjoyed using machines. Well, I think that Americans really developed a love for machinery. Uh, the American experience with machines uh, spread the, the concept of mechanization. Uh, Americans uh, made folk heroes of men like Edison. Uh, they revered uh, the cartoons of Rube Goldberg, which uh, tend to praise uh, mechanical complexity for its own sake. Uh, we really have to say that the American love for machinery transcends economics and that it's become a very important part of our modern American culture. In the next episode, we'll see how this basically European technology and the uniquely American way of doing things came together to such remarkable effect. Out of the Fiery Furnace is brought to you by a company that makes aluminum for transportation, construction, and manufacturers of consumer products all around your house. Commonwealth Aluminum. The companion book, Out of the Fiery Furnace, by Robert Raymond, is published by the Penn State Press and is available at bookstores throughout the country.